Good morning. My name is Erica Monterosa with the Department of Industrial Relations Communications Office, and I would like to welcome you to Cal OSHA's Introduction to Confined Space Hazards Public Webinar. Our speakers today include Deborah Gold, Deputy Chief for Health and Engineering Services, Senior Safety Engineer Dick Roberts, and Senior Safety Engineer Garrett Brown. There will be a Q&A session um, as part of this webinar, and joining our speakers is Vicki Heza, who is the Consultation Program Manager. A few quick notes before we get started, and one of them is that this webinar does utilize some uh, uh, technical, logical tools in order to ask questions. Hopefully you had a chance to read how to go about doing that, and I do see we do have some questions already, so that's wonderful. Um, the Q&A tab is at the top of your screen. If you click on that tab, then you can actually go ahead and type your question in and type the Ask uh, button in order to go ahead and post your question. We won't have a chance to get to all questions today, but we will uh, do our best to answer as many as possible, and uh, we will have some information on how you can contact us to ask additional questions uh, after this webinar. The other thing that I wanted to make sure to let everyone know is that this webinar is being recorded. And um, barring any technical issues, we're hoping to uh, post the webinar on our website within uh, two weeks or less. We will be posting this PowerPoint slideshow today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Deborah Gold, Deputy Chief for Health and Engineering Services. Deborah, go right ahead. Thank you, Erica, and um, thank you all for attending this webinar. We hope that this program will provide a useful introduction to confined space hazards and that you will gain an increased understanding of the types of confined spaces that exist in California workplaces and how we can prevent deaths and serious injuries. There were seven confined space deaths in California last year and many more accidents, including accidents that resulted in serious injuries. That's why Cal OSHA is launching our Zero Confined Space Deaths in 2012 campaign to increase awareness and create a culture of safety in all workplaces across California. As a result of our investigations into the confined space fatalities, we have identified some common problems. First, many employers don't recognize confined spaces and the hazards they pose. Second, many employers don't take steps to ensure that effective protections are in place before employees enter confined spaces. And third, Many employers don't have effective rescue plans. Many assume it is sufficient just to call 911 if something happens. This information is not new. Cal OSHA adopted our first confined space regulations in 1978. In 1991, Federal OSHA adopted a regulation that addressed confined spaces in certain industries, what we typically call in California general industry. The standard excluded construction, agriculture, maritime, telecommunications, and certain other operations. California was required to adopt the federal regulation for the industries that it covered, such as chemical manufacturing, wineries, sewer maintenance, and food manufacturing. For agriculture, construction, maritime, and telecommunications, California's uh, original regulation applies. So here you see the Section 5157, which applies to most California workplaces. And our older regulation became Section 5158, which applies to those certain industries. This can lead to some confusion in the use of terms. For example, in the general industry regulation, any space which is large enough to enter and perform work and has restricted means of entry or exit is a confined space but is not re regulated as a, quote, permit required confined space unless there is a hazardous atmosphere or certain other hazards. Under the other standard, Section 5158, a space that has limited entry and exit isn't considered a confined space unless there is also a hazardous atmosphere. So what we're going to do in this webinar is use the term confined space across both standards. In this webinar, we will be discussing how to recognize confined spaces and prevent employee injuries. 
We will not be getting into the details of the specific standards that apply to different types of industries and operations. At the end of this webinar, there will be information about where you can go for additional help. We will be taking a few questions as time permits at the end of the presentation, but I encourage you to email us any additional questions, and we will respond within the next two weeks. Again, on behalf of all of us at Cal OSHA, I thank you for participating in this webinar. We cannot reach our goal of zero confined space deaths this year without your help and active participation. And now I'd like to introduce Dick Roberts, Senior Safety Engineer, to continue the presentation. Thank you, Deborah, and welcome to all of you to Cal OSHA's public webinar on confined spaces. We will be discussing the basic issues of confined spaces and touch on the regulatory requirements. Our presentation today is primarily intended to get your attention, that is to help you determine if you have confined spaces in your workplace and provide you with information you need to implement an effective program. This webinar is part of a special emphasis program which was initiated in February of 2012. The objective through enforcement and consultation is to raise employers' awareness of the hazards of confined spaces. The special emphasis program includes the compliance and consultation units and requires that during any inspection, a confined space program review will be conducted if appropriate for that employer. As Deborah has already indicated, our goal through this program is zero confined space fatalities in 2012. Our goal for this presentation is to help you understand how to evaluate and control confined spaces, understand the basic program requirements, and to help you know where to go for detailed instructions and information. The problem that we face with confined spaces is twofold. <clears throat> First of all, confined spaces present special requirements to identify and control entry into them. Also, special equipment and trained personnel are necessary prior to entry into a confined space. And second, safety incidents with confined spaces may result in fatalities and many have multiple serious injuries. As this graph shows, California experienced a rise in confined space fatalities in 2011. Confined space injuries and fatalities are not limited to a particular industry or size of employer, but cover a large spectrum of California's work sites. It is important to recognize that confined space hazards can occur in almost any workplace. The fatalities in 2011 occurred in a meatpacking plant, a pharmaceutical manufacturer, a winery, a commercial laundry facility, a paint manufacturer, and a small recycling facility, again, indicating the scope of the problem. The employer is responsible for understanding what a confined space is and evaluating the workplace to determine if any confined spaces exist. If they do, the employer must post the space with a warning sign such as the one pictured here. The employer must warn employees of the hazard associated with the confined space, and the employer must prevent employees from entering until a confined space program is established and implemented. And now I would like to introduce Garrett Brown, Senior Safety Engineer for Calusha. Uh, thank you, Dick, and welcome to everybody this morning. The uh, first step for any effective confined space program is to identify the confined spaces in the workplace. As Deborah Gold pointed out at the beginning, the precise definition of what is a confined space is slightly different in the two main Title VIII regulations. So those differences are explained on the definitions page on Cal OSHA's new confined space webpage at the DOSH website. Specific questions about particular work sites can be answered by the Cal OSHA consultation service whose contact information is listed at the end of the webinar. But the first step is always to identify and post uh, confined spaces in your workplace. There are three uh, basic characteristics for a confined space. It is a space large enough and so configured that workers can enter the space and perform work. It is a space that has restricted means for entry and exit. It is a space that is not designed for continuous employee occupancy. 
This slide has some examples of the confined spaces that are commonly found at Worth. General industry work sites can include tanks, boilers, vats, dust collectors, pits, and sumps. Agricultural work sites can include manure pits and pumping stations. Telecommunications and utility work sites can include manholes and underground vaults of various types. Construction work sites can include any of the above spaces and others that are entered by employees during construction operations. This photo uh, shows an underground steam, tu steam tunnel where work is being performed. This would be a general industry permit required confined space. This photograph shows a horizontal entry into a large tank. This would be a general industry permit required space. This photograph shows a below <coughs> ground pit and pumping station for a swimming pool. This is a general industry permit required confined space for several reasons. Depending on where the work is being done, the piping would present a safety hazard if it would make a non-entry retrieval of an unconscious worker difficult or impossible. If the piping was leaking toxic substances into the pit, in this case chlorine gas, or if the rusting of the metal had created an oxygen deficient atmosphere, there would be a health hazard from the atmosphere. This photograph shows a construction site with a pipeline opening in a sloped pit. The pit itself is not a confined space, but there, and there are other specific Title VIII regulations related to protecting workers in trenches and other excavations. The ventilation system shown in the photo is required to prevent dangerous air contamination inside the pipeline, which is a construction confined space. As mentioned earlier, confined spaces that have hazardous atmospheres require that special procedures be taken by the employer to protect workers entering these spaces. In general industry, spaces with hazardous atmospheres become permit required confined spaces and require written programs, training, and rescue procedures. In all other industries, spaces with hazardous atmospheres are designated as confined spaces but also require written programs, training, and rescue procedures. There are several types of hazardous atmospheres that can exist or develop during employee entries into confined spaces. These include atmospheres with too much or too little oxygen, atmospheres that contain gases or vapors that are flammable or explosive, and atmospheres that contain toxic substances, including acutely toxic atmospheres that are immediately dangerous to life and health, or IDLH. For this reason, before and during all employee entries into confined spaces with existing or potentially hazardous atmospheres, the atmosphere must be tested for the level of oxygen, for flammable or explosive levels of gases or vapors, and for toxic substances like carbon monoxide or hydrogen sulfide. Employers are required to have and to use the appropriate air testing equipment that is calibrated for the substances being measured. Because some gases and vapors are heavier than air, while others are lighter than air, it is very important to always monitor the atmosphere at various heights within the space, near the top of the space, near the bottom of the space, and in the middle of the space. The air testing must be done continuously during the entry as conditions can change inside the space after employees have entered the space. Hazardous atmospheres in confined spaces are, can be caused by a variety of activities and conditions. For example, if the atmosphere inside a vessel is inerted, that is, oxygen is replaced with gases like nitrogen, there will be an oxygen deficient atmosphere. If cleaning products are used by workers inside the space, there can be a health hazard from toxic substances and or a safety hazard from the flammable or explosive atmosphere. If toxic substances from stored materials are absorbed by the walls or equipment in the space, even if the space has been emptied before the employee entry, there can be a health hazard from the toxic substances and or a safety hazard from flammable or explosive atmospheres. 
And finally, if there are rotting organic materials in the space that are generating gases from the decomposition process, there can be health hazards from substances like hydrogen sulfide and methane. Work processes done by the employees inside the space, such as welding or painting or degreasing, can create hazardous atmospheres in the space that did not exist before the employees entered the space and started to work. Also, if the space is connected by pipes or tunnels or walkways to other spaces where hazardous atmospheres exist or are being created, there can be health and safety hazards to employees if these airborne hazards migrate into the space where employees are working. This photograph shows a welder working inside a metal pipe, and the welding process itself has created a potentially hazardous atmosphere in a confined space. In general industry, a confined space can be a permit required confined space for reasons other than just hazardous atmospheres. These include engulfment hazards, such as silos where loose materials are being stored, entrapment hazards, such as in dust collectors and storage bins with downward sloping floors or converging walls, and any other recognized serious safety hazard, such as machinery with moving parts, electrical equipment that could cause serious shocks or electrocutions, steam or heated surfaces that create burn hazards. This graphic shows a storage bin that is an engulfment hazard for employees working on the top surface of loose materials like grain, sand, or salt. And now I will turn it back over to Dick Roberts. Thank you, Garrett. It should be noted that our regulations define the term entry as noted here. Entry occurs as soon as any part of the entrance body breaks the plane of the opening into the space, including any extremities such as hands or feet. Workplaces need to be evaluated and space is posted if it is determined to be a confined space. Entry to confined spaces has to be controlled. A written program must be developed and implemented before employees are allowed to enter the space. The permit is an employer-developed document that includes a review of all necessary elements prior to entry. Hands-on training is required for all personnel involved in the entry, including use of special equipment and familiarization with procedures. This involves all four categories of employees, the entrant, the attendant, the supervisor, and rescue personnel. Annual refresher training for rescue personnel is also required as part of the annual review. This photograph is an example of a tripod retrieval system that is used for non-entry rescue. The employee is attached to a retrieval line that can be used to withdraw him from the confined space if necessary. For our purposes, <coughs> rescue and emergency services, <coughs> we require that non-entry rescue be performed whenever possible. You must utilize a retrieval system unless the use of that system would be ineffective in the space. In addition, there must be an attendant and a trained emergency rescue personnel available at the site during the entry. Practice simulated rescue operations at least every 12 months in an actual space or a representative space based on the opening size, configuration, and accessibility of the actual confined spaces that will be entered. And we cannot emphasize enough that calling 911 in and of itself is not a rescue plan. Outside emergency service agencies may be a part of your rescue plan, but they must be trained in your procedures and they must be available to provide immediate assistance. There are two primary sections in Title VIII that cover confined spaces in California, as have already been mentioned. Section 5157 provides the requirements for general industry permit required program. It provides guidance and details for the establishment of a written program. 
Section 5158 provides requirements for these other industries. It is important to know which regulations apply to your workplace. If you have any concerns or questions about your workplace and the confined space program, contact the consultation service at the numbers and the websites provided here. Thank you very much, Dick. Well, now we've gotten to the question and answer session, and again, um, joining our presenters and speakers is Vicki Heza, Consultation Program Manager. And uh, just a, a quick reminder, we do have some questions that are, have already been asked, and we will be getting to those. But if you um, would like a quick reminder and would like to ask a question, uh, you can go ahead and click the Q&A tab at the top of the Microsoft Office live meeting screen, and then type in your question and click Ask. Um, there was a question earlier asking whether these PowerPoint um, slides would be available to the audience, and yes, we will be posting those to our website later today. So without further ado, I would like to uh, go ahead and get started. Our first question is from Alfonso. Alfonso is asking, can you explain the new confined space focused program that I was told is being unrolled by Cal OSHA? And Garrett Brown, do you mind taking that, that question? Yes, certainly. Uh, <clears throat> what uh, we started in the uh, 6th of February is when it started for the next year at least. It's a special emphasis program. It doesn't involve any programmed inspections. Some people were concerned that these were going to be additional targeted inspections on particular industries or the like. But because, as Dick explained, there are so many confined spaces in different industries, what we've asked is for each of our co compliance, safety, and health officers, when they're doing any inspection for the next year, to look around to first ask the employer if they are aware of any confined spaces on their work site and to look for them during the course of the walk around. And if the employer uh, acknowledges that there are uh, confined spaces or if the compliance officer finds these confined spaces during the walk around, then the compliance officer will do a review of the written program uh, that the employer has uh, for the confined space and the training that they've provided for employees and what provisions they've made for an effective, immediately available rescue service. So that's what's being done by the enforcement, but it is a multi-unit uh, activity. The consultation service will also be doing, during their on-site inspections for the next year, a similar process of trying to identify confined spaces in the, in the work sites where they're uh, doing the walk around and work with the employer to develop the necessary confined space programs and procedures if they don't already have them if their employees are entering confined spaces. And we will also, through the consultation service, be doing as much of an outreach as we can to employers in the state, especially small employers who may not recognize confined spaces in their workplaces to bring this information to them. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Deirdre is asking, is an elevator shaft a confined space? And if so, is it permit required? Deborah Gold, do you mind uh, addressing that question? Uh, general, generally speaking, uh, an elevator uh, a pit would be a permit required confined space. However, it may be a confined space that can be reclassified to a non-permit required confined space through locking out of um, power sources and machinery so that the, um, it, it, you would want to post generally the entry to the, perm to the elevator pit as a permit required confined space. Uh, and then uh, when elevator service people come out or elevator inspectors come out, it may be reclassified uh, based on removal of the non-atmospheric hazards. Obviously, if, if there's a, there may be some situation where an elevator pit is subject to atmospheric hazards, and then you could reclassify it just based on uh, locking out of, of equipment. And so 
if you, if you have a specific question, I would encourage you to get in touch with consultation and have them review your, your specific space. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Bill Mitchell. Uh, he's asking, in construction, would you consider trenches as a confined space due to ladders needed for entry and exit, uh, even a four-foot deep trench? And uh, to answer Bill's question, Dick, would you like to take that one? Dick Roberts, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's try that <laughs> again. <laughs> um, trenches in and of themselves have their own set of regulations, as uh, you're probably aware, and they are not classified as confined spaces per se, but as uh, the picture that we showed with the pipe, uh, there may be work activities within that trench uh, that qualify as a confined space and therefore are subject to the 5158 uh, regulations. Um, but the trenches in and of themselves, even a four-foot trench is not classified as a confined space because there are other regulations that control um, the hazards associated with the trenches, such as uh, collapse of the trench and shoring requirements. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, our next question is from Tammy Royer, and Tammy's asking for us to provide the website address to retrieve this presentation, and I do have that information, so let me jump here. Um, if you would like to ask questions after this webinar, this is definitely the place to do it at infocons at dir.ca.gov, and we also have a web page that is dedicated to confined space hazards and resources, as well as the regulations, and you can actually access that, it, I understand, is live now um, at this web address, www.dir.ca.gov slash dosh slash confined space. All right, we, our next question is from Dave Beal. Dave is asking, would an attic space be considered a confined space? Deborah Gold, would you mind addressing that one? An attic space may be considered a confined space, but, may, may, but would not be considered a permit-required confined space, say it was being entered for general industry purposes, unless there were either a um, hazardous atmosphere or some other serious hazard within the space. Um, and in construction, it would only be if there was a hazardous atmosphere. So it, it is, a, 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 unless there are steps and easy entry to the attic, which of course there are some attics that that's true of, but in imagining an attic that has like a ladder entryway, you would review it for uh, being a confined space, but not necessarily a permit required one. Thank you, Deborah. Our next question is from Gade Mobley. Gade is asking how many of the fatalities that have occurred in recent years were rescuer fatalities. In other words, they went in to rescue the person that was in distress and uh, they were a fatality as a result. Garrett Brown? Uh, nationally, I believe the statistic is, uh, is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of all confined space deaths are would-be rescuers. And that's one of the most tragic aspects of it is that people's oftentimes family members or co-workers rush in to save somebody and are uh, overcome themselves. That happened here in California last fall, which was one of the impetuses for our special emphasis program. In Kern County, there were a 16-year-old who was working to clean out an underground uh, drainage ditch in a green garbage recycling center was overcome and his 22-year-old brother who was outside the space rushed in to save his younger brother and they both died. So that's a very common scenario and one of the reasons why it's so very important that there be adequate rescue procedures and <clears throat> in place to be immediately available with trained individuals so that you know, rescuers are not tempted to do something that they're not trained for, don't have the equipment for, and end up dying themselves. 
Thank you, Garrett. Um, we've got a question from Khalid, and actually we did have a few people that mentioned that they had some, some issues with their audio on their computer systems. Khalid is asking, he's saying he missed earlier training because he didn't have audio, on, and is the training being recorded? And Khalid, yes, we are recording today's webinar training, and barring any technical difficulties, we're hoping in uh, the next few weeks to have that posted on our website. In addition, we will have the PowerPoint that we're reviewing right now posted on our website today. Uh, so we've got more questions coming in, and one of the questions One of the questions is in regards to multi-gas meters and their calibration. Lisa Orgera is saying, how often does a multi-gas meter need to be calibrated? Who can answer that one? Dick, is that something that you can answer for us? I think us? Garrett could probably answer that. You think for Garrett us? can answer it? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Garrett Brown, you are on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it depends. First of all, you should always, you know, if all else fails, read the manual. Um, you should follow manufacturer's uh, recommendations. But generally speaking, they have to be factory calibrated once a year. But the most important thing is to do what's known as a bump test, which is before use of the gas meter on a daily basis, is to have a span gas or some other target gas that you verify that the unit is actually working properly. Lots of uh, city Sewer departments, for example, uh, have a uh, pretty well-run program of training uh, sewer workers to how to conduct bump tests with uh, multiple gas meters before they go out in the morning if they're going to be doing confined space entries during the course of the day. And that should be the practice of anyone uh, who is uh, doing confined space entries into hazardous atmospheres. Thank you. I'd just like to add, this is uh, Deborah. Um, it's important when you're entering into things like uh, aircraft fuel tanks or things where the uh, flammable gas that may be present isn't the flammable gas that's uh, typically used in a multi-gas meter to test uh, for flammable atmospheres that you either apply a correction factor, factor if the manufacturer can provide one for the gas that's likely to be present or calibrate that meter to the specific gas. Otherwise, you can get incorrect readings. All right, and we do have a comment from one of our Calosha consultation folks, and, and Vicki, I'm going to ask you to address this a bit. Um, uh, Mr. Santiago is saying, Calosha consultation can assist employers during an on-site visit that will include confined spaces. However, he's emphasizing that uh, they won't be able to assist employers if the only thing that they're interested in is uh, confined spaces. Vicki, can you address that a bit more for us? Certainly, be happy to. Um, um, Ms. Santiago is, uh, it was in fact a long-term employee of Calosa Consultation, enjoying her retirement. I appreciate her input. Uh, <laughs> um, the, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to evaluate programs, uh, in a vacuum. And so we do have to conduct an on-site evaluation. Uh, as part of any on-site evaluation, we have to include the injury and illness prevention program. So it is, it would not, uh, you know, to do such an isolated, uh, small scope type of evaluation is not the type of thing that we typically, typically would do. Um, it would be part of a, uh, you know, a slightly more comprehensive, uh, evaluation, which as I said would include at the very least an injury and illness prevention program evaluation. And hopefully any employer that would ask us to come on site would be interested in, you know, kind of a, a, a broader overview than just that little slice of your know, confined space compliance. I hope that answers that, you know. Yeah, I definitely think okay. so. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Esther, for, for bringing that to our attention. <laughs> um, Daniel has a question about crawl spaces beneath residential buildings and whether they're considered a confined space, and if so, if permit is required. Um, Deborah, do you mind addressing that one? Again, uh, the issue is that it, it in all likelihood may be a confined space, but whether it's a permit required confined space would depend on the existence of other hazards. 
Um, and that doesn't mean if it's not a permit required confined space that you shouldn't take precautions when employees enter um, in terms of looking for hazards that may, may be a problem. Um, so again, it, it involves being able to survey that crawl space or attic, making sure that there aren't other hazards that would trigger the permit required confined space standard. Thank you. Garrett, the next one I've got is for you. Juan Aragones is asking, he's saying uh, that they use non-entry rescue using a retrieval device. Do they need a rescue trained personnel standing uh, on standby? It, uh, again, you should be sure to understand which standard you're under, 5157 or 5158, but uh, in, in both of them, there's, in, in 5157, there's a requirement to have a standby person who is uh, able to conduct a rescue. A rescue can be non-entry retrieval, which is actually the preferable uh, way of doing it, as Doug, uh, Dick Roberts mentioned, and it's required, actually, to have non-retrieval, non-entry retrieval equipment on site. Um, the specifics of a, of a particular operation, though, you would have to uh, look at the possibility that the non-retrieval system fails for some reason or another. That's often the case if people are crawling in vaults where they're behind or underneath piping and the like, uh, which would make a non-retrieval situation very, I mean, non-entry retrieval situation difficult because the lines would be tangled. So in any given situation, there may be a requirement uh, looking at it is in the worst case scenario for an entry retrieval or an entry rescue, at which point then it's the employer's responsibility to have on site a standby person who would be immediately available with the training and equipment necessary to conduct an entry rescue. Wonderful. And you know, there's a connected question here. Um, uh, Dick, I'm going to ask you to address this. Um, Gilbert Verdusco is saying, could you explain more on the number of attendees at a confined space, the attendee and the standby person, and the role of the standby person? And I, I also want to add to that, do those people have to be trained? Dick? Uh, <coughs> yes, they do. And as Garrett pointed out, uh, there are some uh, slight differences depending upon uh, the nature of your work. But for the general industry, uh, category um, to to do an entry, the standby person has to be at the site. They have to be uh, trained in uh, emergency and rescue uh, services, including first aid and CPR. And um, they have to be at the site. They have to be uh, essentially at the opening to the entry, uh, available immediately to provide help uh, whenever that might be needed. Very good. And one more for you, Dick. Um, okay. Which regulation applies, uh, James Morris is asking, which regulation applies to a construction activity such as painting that's being performed in an existing space uh, like a water storage tank? Um, they, well, that would be considered construction maintenance, so it would fall under the construction safety order um, in general and 5158 for <coughs> the purposes of confined space. Thank you. Okay. We have some other questions in regards to construction um, and I had it and I lost it. Bear with me, folks. There's one that's connected that I wanted to to include. Okay, Lauren. Lauren is saying, we are a subcontractor in the construction industry. Are we required to have a confined space written program or any part of our safety program address a confined space if we do not have any confined spaces or work in any confined spaces? I'll uh, address that if that's okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, and the answer to that question is uh, no. If you don't enter confined spaces and your employees don't enter the confined spaces, then you're not required to have a confined space program. However, in the event that you, uh, as a subcontractor, work uh, for somebody else that is doing work in confined spaces and you're required to, to work in there uh, for whatever reason, you need to um, be in communication with the uh, prime contractor. Uh, you and, as a subcontractor and prime contractor need to be discussing the confined space program and the uh, 
hazards that you're likely to run into and the requirements that you have to work in that space. Um, even though you don't have a confined space program of your own, you're still obliged to comply with whatever confined space program uh, is effective for that um, for that work area. Um, and I hope that answers the question there. Thank you. Does anybody have anything to add to that? All right. We've got a question from Stephanie Coleman. Stephanie is saying, if attendants are available for a non-entry rescue, but the site plan for an entry rescue, if non-entry failed, is the local fire department, is that the same as calling 911, which is not a plan? The fire department rescue service is notified before the entry and is available. Deborah, do you mind taking that one? Okay. Um, if you have, there, there's a requirement that an off-site rescue, first off, there has to be one person available on-site to initiate the rescue. And that may be the, it's not the attendant, but it may be that other standby person. But secondly, there has to be pre-planning, not just notification, but pre-planning. If you're using the local fire department, they have to have had a chance to practice in that space or in a representative space with the same access issues and, and everything else, and at least annually. So it's not just notification to the fire department. There actually has to have been an opportunity for them to understand your space and make a and therefore make a, a reasonable, knowledgeable commitment to performing timely rescue for you. So it, you may be able to make that arrangement with a, with a local fire department, but it's more than just notification. All right. Thank you very much. We have some questions from folks that are asking specifics. Um, and... Um, Oh, I, yes. I hear somebody. I hear somebody online. There's some voice coming through from someone online that should not be on. So whoever is has got that rolling, can you please mute your phone? Okay. We've got someone saying um, Edward, is, and some of the others are asking some specifics, and so I just want to uh, caution folks that. We're, this is an introduction to confined space hazards. We're going to answer as many questions as we can. But again, if you have questions that are specific, um, then your best uh, bet is to actually send your question to infocons at dir.ca.gov or to call our uh, Cal OSHA consultation service at 1-800-963-9424 and set up an on-site evaluation, not only of the confined space, but also for other things that you need to be aware of so that you can uh, have safeguards there. Now, without further ado, Edward is um, saying, would a sump on an underground diesel storage tank, which houses a diesel submissible pump that's shallow, three to three and a half feet deep, be per a permit required space? Garrett, do you mind taking that one? Well, with a caveat that uh, uh, Erica just mentioned, that it's, I mean, it's impossible to give you a definitive answer without seeing some of these spaces. There's no way you can describe them over the phone. So that's a good reason to contact consultation and see if they arrange an on-site uh, visit if, as their resources uh, permit, of course. But uh, in general, again, you just, you apply the same three criteria. You know, if you have what, the th there's three elements that make it, a uh, confined space, uh, which is what we uh, talked about earlier <coughs> uh, in in the in the webinar, that it's large enough and configured so that an employee can bodily enter and perform the work, has limited openings for exit and entry, and is not designed for continuous employee occupancy. Now that makes it a confined space under the 5157 general industry. And then it's not regulated as a confined space unless it has one of the other elements that we were talking about, which make it a permit-required confined space, which includes hazardous uh, atmospheres, materials that can engulf an employee, such as liquids, uh, if it has an internal configuration that could lead to entrapment or engulfment, or any other serious uh, recognized uh, safety or health hazard. So from the way you describe it, I think it would be, if it was in general industry, a, a permit-required confined space for 
the concerns about the hazardous atmosphere if it's a diesel uh, <clears throat> space, and I assume it would be either underground or below ground, so that exit, you know, so that the three, first three characteristics would be hit as well. But so I think the answer is yes. But again, uh, lots of times it's difficult unless you see the actual space and understand the operations and understand how and when and under what circumstances employees enter them to give a definitive answer over the telephone. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Now, Paul Burnett is asking, do confined spaces on construction sites have to be labeled or posted? Um, Dick, can you take that one? Um, I'm not familiar with the posting requirement for construction sites. Um, I don't know if Garrett could respond to that or not. But I don't okay. Garrett, can you, can you take that one then? The question again is, do confined spaces, whoops, just lost it. The question was whether confined spaces at construction sites have to be labeled or posted, whether there has to be some sort of posting. Well, the, the best answer for that actually is to look at 5158, because off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Fair enough. We did have a question from someone, and, and now I've lost the question, so I apologize, but uh, who was asking whether we have investigators that can go and issue permits for permit required entry, and I thought that that bared mentioning for those that are new to the topic of confined spaces and their requirements. Deborah, do you mind addressing that question? Sure. Um, the permit is something that the employer develops. So an employer, <clears throat> let's say general industry, is required to survey their facility or their operation, determine if there are confined spaces and then determine if there are any permit, if any of them are permit required, and to post them as, you know, as being permit required and find space, you know, entry prohibited or unauthorized entry prohibited or signs of that nature. Um, so issuance of the permit is then done by the employer. There is an example permit um, in our, in our actually at the end of our, the regulation as an appendix, and also in the. Um, in the Cal OSHA uh, confined space uh, publication that there's a link to on the web page. Um, so there are some examples, but no, we don't in issue permits. Uh, the employer issues that permit. Very good. Okay. Anything to add to that? Anybody? Uh, no, but there is a question from Deidre. I don't know uh, where it is in your list, but <clears throat> she's asking about um, where you have a sump like the diesel one mentioned and it's determined it's a permit required, is it appropriate to say our policy is our employees are not permitted to enter and if entry is needed, we will hire a qualified third uh, party specialist, I assume. Thanks, Dick. That's a good question. Do you uh, want to take that one? Yes, it's an excellent question. And uh, yes, our regulations allow employers to do exactly that. Uh, if you read in 5157, um, for the general industry confined space uh, regulations. It uh, points out that uh, you have that option. If, you, uh, if, if the option is that you don't want your employees to enter, you have to do some specific preliminary things, basically identify the spaces and post them, and you just tell your employees that you don't ever go in there. Um, but when you have a third party uh, come in to do the work, you have to be able to identify the hazards for those folks that come in to actually do the work in the space, and you have to ensure that they have uh, a confined space program of their own. So, yeah, you don't have to expose your employees to that hazard. So. Very good. Uh, and, and a connected question to that one from um, Renee Martin is, if they hire a subcontractor to do work in a confined space, do they need a plan or can they use the subcontractor's plan? So, Dick, what you're explaining is that they need to ensure that the subcontractor's plan is sufficient. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. There is. There are certain elements of the plan that they still have to have in place because you have to obviously identify the confined spaces and have them posted. Um, but if your intention is to have a subcontractor do the work, then you need to ensure that the subcontractor has an appropriate confined space plan and that they're aware of the hazards that are in your spaces. Okay. And again, if you have more questions about, about more specifics on that, uh, folks, you can also 
emails at infocons at dir.ca.gov. Uh, we have a question from Daniel, um, Vicki, who's asking, would a consultation visit be able to include testing for evaluation of atmospheric hazards? And if so, how long would it take to schedule a visit? <laughs> it's a great question. Right. Well, I did see that. Um, let me work that backwards. Uh, <laughs> okay. Daniel, depending upon where you are located, um, that will really be the criteria for the, how long it will take for our staff to get out there. We do have a backlog. Um, but we uh, might be able to prioritize a request for confined space assistance given the FTP. Um, with regards to your question about air monitoring, um, we would, our position is that it's the employer's responsibility to do their air monitoring. Any monitoring we would do would be a moment in time. And uh, if you have a confined space, you know, then you need to have a system in place where you're going to be checking the um, the atmosphere, you know, prior to any entry. And so for us to conduct a moment in time air monitoring for you is of obvious limited value. So uh, generally speaking, no, we would not do just that. However, if you're looking for a more comprehensive confined space assistance, where, where you know, we're, we're available to do that by all means. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, all right, and we've got another question who is, let's see, Jose Martinez is asking something connected, Garrett. Are there any particular specs on the labels being used to identify confined space? Is, uh, is there a specific language in the regulation that, that details that, Garrett? Well, again, you should look at, it depends on your operation, 5157 and 5158 are, are slightly different in their requirements. I think the, the, the 5157, frankly, is the one that I'm more familiar with, and I think there is language in the, in the uh, text of the standard uh, which uh, requires the, uh, the, the postings be, have a specific language. So I would look in 5157. All right, our next question is from M. Hall. And M. Hall asks, if we absolutely do not allow employees into a confined space, this is for Deborah, and we post a danger sign, but the employee does still enter, do we need a written rescue plan? Right. And I, I wanted to call your attention. There's a requirement not only to post a sign saying danger, permit required, confined space, do not enter, or other similar language is basically the... 5157 uh, requirement, but there's a, but if the employer has decided that employees will not enter permit spaces, they have to take effective measures to prevent all such employees from entering the permit spaces. So typically, I think in one of the photos in the presentation, you see a hatch with a number of bolts around the, the uh, edges of it or something like that. Um, so uh, you need to do – sometimes it takes more than simply posting a sign. Uh, you need effective measures. And so if, that, if something were to occur where an employee entered a space, and in the course of division investigations we have had that happen where employees regularly enter spaces not using permit entry procedures, even though there may be a sign, um, you need to look at, do I have effective procedures to prevent the employee from entering? So no, the issue would not be if employees enter despite the sign, do I need rescue procedures? The, the issue really is effective procedures to prevent unauthorized entry. Um, and that may be a situation where you want to put a mechanical barrier to that. Okay. Thank you very much. We do have another question. Um, Paul is asking how often do confined space entrance attendants and supervisors need to be retrained? Garrett, do you do you mind taking that one? Uh, I, I, again, you want to look at the, the specific uh, uh, standard which affects your uh, your operation. But I believe in 5157, it's an annual uh, training. Right. Okay. Very good. I think we've got time for one more question, and <clears throat> and I think we already answered one of these from Juan, who's asking about uh, using non-entry rescue, using retrieval um, <laughs> devices. Uh, 
Uh, we do have one question from Uriah Donaldson, um, who's saying a Kalosha inspector in our area recently said a bunker at at an ammonia registration. Refrigeration. Oh, refrigeration, thank you. Cold storage could be classified as a non-permit confined space. You know, and, and we're asked, they're asking whether we agree or not. And I, I think, Vicki, I think your, your point, again, is that some of these are, are pretty specific, aren't they, Vicki? Um, well, actually, I think Garrett made that point. You know, without uh, being able to actually visually look at the uh, circumstance, it's, it's really difficult to make that call over the phone or, you know, uh, uh, you know in this type of setting. Um, so I, I really don't think, uh, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable answering that question, yay or nay, no. you know, without being able to eyeball it, to be perfectly honest. Exactly. Um, can I expand on just that a little bit? <laughs> um, this is Dick Roberts. Um, one of the problems that you have with this is that there's a lot of uh, local uh, jargon that's used to identify components mm -hmm. of a facility. And, you know, calling something a bunker, we have no clue what that might be. So mm -hmm. to answer that question without looking at what you're, you know, physically looking at uh, what this item is, is uh, impossible for us to evaluate. No, but I, I think the the point also that we'd like to make is that this does occur in multiple industries, and so that's something that you need to evaluate. Um, we had one question in terms of what um, Bill Taylor is asking, how Cal OSHA defines limited or restricted means of entry. Um, Deborah, do you mind addressing that question? Um, yeah, that's a fairly complicated question. Um, on a, as a quick um, rule of thumb, the tendency, the federal OSHA has defined, um, uh, has gone the con to the contrary and said, if you enter by a door and there's a staircase down, that that would typically not be considered to be limited means of entry or exit, but there could be hazards in the within the space that would change that to a, to limited means of entry or exit, such as a pipe or ductwork or other physical obstruction so that in the entering and exiting um, either into the space or within the space, movement within the space, you're having to go under and over different kinds of obstacles. So um, each space is evaluated on a, on a uh, you know, on an individual basis um, to determine whether there is in fact obstacles to entry or exit so that if an employee were to become incapacitated within the space, would we be able to get him out? Would the person be capable of self-rescue? Uh, would rescuers be able to get in to to, um, to take care of that person who became incapacitated? So that's kind of the, those are the questions that we ask. And wherever you deviate from the from the concept of door and staircase, you're open to that this this may be a per, uh, may be a confined space. But even if there is a door and staircase, you still may be in a in a situation where it's considered a confined space. Wonderful. Well, you know that that brings to a close our webinar. I want to again thank our speakers and all of you who joined us. Uh, please don't hesitate to visit our web page that has more detail. It also has links to the regulations so that you can, you can review those at your leisure. And before you go, one last thing is that we really would